The Mercedes GLB delivers to market the first properly practical mid-sized SUV from the three-pointed star. There's enough room for seven seats, enough capability for light off-road excursions, and enough of a premium feel to make other class rivals feel rather low rent. In short, it's a potentially appealing package. So, yet another Mercedes SUV. This is actually the eighth, but there's a really significant place for this GLB model in the three-pointed star lineup. And here, we're gonna tell you why. Perhaps you're familiar with Mercedes SUVs, in which case you'll know that the smallest GLA model suits only quite small families, while the mid-sized GLC is sometimes too expensive for larger ones, and it can't be ordered with the third seating row that many of them will need. In the same way that at the top of the Stuttgart brand's SUV range, the G-Class Gelandewagen offers a practical, sensible alternative to a GLE, such is the role of a GLB against a GLA or a GLC. Still with us? If you are, then you'll be interested in the way that Mercedes wants to use this car to address a growing niche in the mid-sized family SUV class, that first seven seats. Now, the VW Group currently does quite well here with contenders like the Skoda Kodiak, the Seat Taraco, and the VW Tiguan Allspace. The Koreans provide the Hyundai Santa Fe and the Kia Sorento. Plus, there are seven-seat versions of the Nissan X-Trail. If you want a premium badge on this kind of car, though, Prior to the arrival of this Mercedes, there was only the Land Rover Discovery Sport. That's the car that this GLB takes on most directly. And like the Disco, the question it asks is whether you really need a lumbering, large segment, family-sized SUV when you can have one of these. Practicality, prestige, and pragmatism. What's not to like? All of which sounds good until you learn that this is effectively a seven-seat Mercedes A-Class. It sits on an only slightly lengthened version of the same compact platform as that little hatch does, and it shares all the same engineering and the front cabin architecture. If you're looking for something that's family sized that doesn't sound especially promising, but Mercedes calls passenger and luggage space here generous, and it reckons that the third seating row is good for more than a couple of eunuchs. Well, we'll see. What we can predict is that this car will deliver a higher level of interior quality than anything previously seen in this segment. It's also claimed to be potentially better off-road than many of its contemporaries. And for the first time in this class, there's a high-performance model, the GLB 35, for really fast families. Here, though, our focus is on the mainstream range. Is this the Mercedes SUV you never knew you needed? Let's find out. You can see the logic in creating this GLV. Um, every third Mercedes sold these days is an SUV, every fourth a compact car. So a compact SUV ought to tick a lot of boxes, particularly if it offers the kind of seven seat versatility that no affordable Mercedes has ever previously delivered. Uh, and maybe a little bit of the adventurous off-piste capability that those mini G-Class looks seem to promise. Well, that's maybe asking a bit too much given that pretty much all the engineering in play here was originally developed for frugal family hatchbacks, not go anywhere Jolanderwagens. Reassuringly though, it's been evolved a bit for this GLB. Uh, a longer wheelbase is combined with a wider track and a stiffer body. Plus, the raised suspension is of the sophisticated uh, rear multi-link variety uh, that only the most expensive and powerful versions of Mercedes smaller models normally tend to get all of which helps to mitigate the roly-poly handling that you might expect a relatively compact, tall, boxy SUV to deliver. And you won't be finding excuses to take the twisty way home in this car, but if you do, and you happen to find yourself running late, you'll find body control kept decently in check and steering, which is light, but quite precise. 
Steering is one of the drive parameters that you can alter via the settings of the Dynamic Select driving mode system. Uh, suspension though isn't. You certainly can't have the pillowy air suspended setup that's available on the only slightly larger GLC, but European spec GLBs can be ordered with optional adaptive damping and by all accounts they ride very well with it. But for our market, uh, mainstream versions of this car uh, can only be had on passive steel springs which get easily unsettled over porous surfaces and thump over deep tarmac tears and speed humps. A rival Land Rover Discovery Sport, uh, well that certainly rides more smoothly but it doesn't seem to have as much front end traction. The other drive parameters that Dynamic Select influences via its comfort, eco, sport and individual settings are throttle response and the gear shift timings for the dual clutch automatic transmission that all GLBs have to have. Now this box comes in different forms depending on the engine you've chosen. It features seven speeds on the entry level variant in the range, the front driven GLB 200 uh, which uses a Renault derived 1.3 litre 163 HP petrol unit. You might I think that's rather small for the task of propelling just over one and a half tons of Stuttgart SUV real estate with any kind of real purpose. It actually doesn't do too badly and if this Mercedes will mainly be used for suburban duties then it might even qualify as an engine of choice. Predictably pulling power is at a bit of a premium but it spins easily and it powers you to 62 and 9.1 seconds en route to 129 miles an hour. We would understand though if having considered that and perhaps the perspective that a car of this sort has no business sharing an engine with a Renault Clio, uh, if you decided to limit your perusals to the other mainstream engine offered to GLB customers, the 2 litre diesel unit that we're trying today. It comes in two forms, both with enough extra torque on tap to require the fitment of a different 8-speed version of that dual-clutch auto gearbox. Uh, the popular choice will be the more affordably pitched GLC 200D, which offers 150 HP and can be had in front-driven form or with the formatic all-wheel drive option that Mercedes thinks many GLB folk are going to want. This base diesel unit's performance stats are much the same as the uh, entry-level petrol unit, but it won't feel like that in real world driving, the bigger capacity diesel delivers nearly 30% more pulling power through the gears. Should that be insufficient, then you'll want the GLB 220D model that we've selected for this test, which offers the same 2 litre diesel engine and uprated 190 horsepower form. That's enough to get you to 62 in just 7.6 seconds en route to 135 miles an hour, and it has to be had in formatic form. Torque takes another leap forward from 320 newton meters in the 200D to 400 newton meters here, and that will make this an ideal tow car. So Mercedes has included pre-installed of a trailer coupling for GLB 220D variants sold in this country. All formatic GLBs get a brake towing capacity raised from 1.8 to 2 tonnes. And we should say a little about Formatic because it's quite a sophisticated system with fully variable torque distribution based around the dynamic select driving mode you choose. Uh, in either eco or comfort, it usually directs 80% of drive to the front wheels. In sport, uh, the ratio is 70-30, but of course, if a lack of traction is detected, both axles will be brought into play. Uh, the Mini G Wagen looks suggest that buried somewhere in that options list really ought to be the kind of low range crawler gearbox that would give this car some real off-road prowess but of course there's nothing like that. In fact uh, mainstream versions aren't really intended for any kind of uh, off-piste shenanigans at all although on the all-wheel drive variants a selectable formatic display is available on the right hand side of the instrument cluster and the center stack media screen also has a selectable adventure theme which delivers an off-road display with gradient compass uh, roll angle and steering angle readouts but all that is tinsel you have to pay extra for something a bit more useful in terms of mud plugging assistance specifically the brand's optional off-road engineering package that's available if you order a formatic diesel with one of the AMG line trim levels in the extremely unlikely event that you're the kind of GLB customer who'll uh, like the idea of taking on gnarly tracks and ploughed fields in this car, it'd be wise not to get your hopes up too much. Uh, this package doesn't do anything about this car's limited ground clearance and its restricted wheel articulation. 
but you do get an additional off-road dynamic select driving mode which adjusts the power delivery and the ABS control in a way that will help you out in light forest tracks. Plus, in the off-road setting, the all-wheel drive clutch acts as an inter-axle differential lock with the basic torque distribution front to rear a balanced 50-50. Uh, there is also a downhill speed regulation feature that's basically hill descent control to ease you down slippery slopes. Plus, there's some extra all-wheel drive screen graphics and you get a clever off-road light built into the multi-beam LED headlamps that in off-road mode remains permanently switched on at speeds of up to 31 miles an hour and it offers a wider, brighter light distribution in front of the vehicle and it allows you to more easily see obstacles in rough terrain in the dark. None of this will be enough to allow this Mercedes to rival the considerable off-road prowess of its Land Rover Discovery Sport chief competitor, but it will be quite enough to get this car to, say, a remote Lake District cottage, and that's the sort of thing that'll represent the limit of GLB rough road ownership ambition. The brand has clearly decided that there's no point in over-engineering things here, but just enough has been done. And should you ever venture onto unpaved, slippery surfaces, you'll probably be quite surprised by just how far this car will go through light mud or up steep, gravelly inclines. A tad ironically, the only GLB variant that gets the off-road engineering package as standard is the version that's least likely to ever want to use it, the top Mercedes-AMG GLB 35 formatic performance derivative. Now this, uh, which is the first compact seven-seat model ever developed by the Stuttgart brand's Falterback tuning division, offers a level of performance that was never previously available to customers shopping in the sector for upper mid-sized seven-seat SUVs. Now you could argue that's because a crossover of this kind based on a super shopping rocket, in this case the A35 4Matic hot hatch, was never really needed, but Mercedes has provided one anyway, mating its familiar 2-litre petrol turbo 306 horsepower power plant to a specific AMG performance 4Matic drive setup and a rifle crack 8-speed AMG speed shift DCT paddle shift auto gearbox. Now if you're quick with those shifters, 62 can be crested in just 5.2 seconds from rest and top speed has to be restrained to 155 miles an hour, all to the accompaniment of an artificially induced but rather animated cracking engine soundtrack. There are extra slippery and sport plus dynamic select drive mode settings and the system's different modes are linked to AMG Dynamics Agility Control which adds a further layer of drive adaptability, altering torque distribution, steering characteristics and stability system intervention to suit different conditions. It's an interesting confection, but rather at odds with the essential character of this car. Uh, possibly of rather more interest to GLB folk are the various electrified variants that you can ask your dealer about. Predictably, this model has been engineered with the same plug-in hybrid powertrain that you'll also find fitted to other compact Mercedes models. Uh, the GLB 250E version in question, mating a 1.33 litre petrol engine with a gearbox mounted 75 kilowatt electric motor that's powered powered by a 15.6 kilowatt hour battery and that's able to provide an electric range of just over 30 miles. There is a combined system output of uh, 218 horsepower and that means that the 62 miles an hour sprint uh, can take no more than about 7 seconds. If that's not enough electrification for you then have a chat with your dealer about the full EV EQB version of this model. Ultimately though, it's hard to see too many GLBs being plugged in or pounded around racetracks. Uh, this car is a little too old school in outlook for that, which in some ways is rather refreshing. We think Mercedes should have offered adaptive damping here and have engineered a proper off-road halo version, a bit like the trailhawk version of Jeep's Compass, but otherwise there's a lot to like here. Longer trips can certainly be on the agenda because despite the boxy shape, refinement across the range is impressive and that's thanks to heavy sound deadening. And in its upper spec guises, you can have this car with all the brand's latest camera safety and semi-autonomous driving tech if you want it. Ultimately, to our eyes, the GLB is a more sensible choice than any other SUV the company makes, but its boxy looks will probably marginalise it uh, to a relatively forgotten corner of most Mercedes showrooms, which is a pity because in the crossover class, there's really nothing quite like it.
The look of the GLB draws inspiration from Mercedes Grand G-Class Glanderwagen, uh, which you need to know because otherwise you really might wonder why it's quite so squarical and van-like. Even designer Robert Lesnick describes it as a box with rounded edges. Uh, the dimensions are a little confusing too. This car is actually uh, almost the same size as the GLC model that it supposedly sits beneath in the Mercedes SUV lineup. Uh, the GLB is 4.63 metres long and that sees it measuring in only 21 millimetres shorter than the GLC and it's actually 18 mils taller than that car. The underpinnings here, though, are very different to a GLC. The GLB sits on the MFA2 architecture that the brand uses for its most compact models, although that small segment platform has had to be extended by 100 mils so that this car's third seating row will fit. Uh, particularly short front and rear overhangs. They're a styling feature here. And the SUV vibe is emphasised by polished aluminium roof rails, uh, this black lower sill section with its silver strip, and the squared off black clad wheel arches, which house aerodynamically optimized rims of between 18 and 20 inches in size. We've got the 19 inch AMG 5 twin spoke tantalite gray rims here. Another keynote styling feature is the way that the lower window line kicks up at the base of the C pillar. Let's move now to this very upright front end. Now it's probable that your chosen GLB will be of the AMG line trim variety, in which case it will, like this test car, feature a single louvre grille surrounded by chromed pins. Uh, should budget restrict you, however, to the base sport variant, that grille loses the twinkling pins and it has quite a different twin louvre silver finish. Another change of sports spec lies with the addition of this lower front apron with its chrome splitter, which is flanked by these distinctive large black framed corner intakes. The chunky square headlights on all variants feature incorporated outer daytime running light strips and they're of the full LED high performance variety, while plusher variants get the more advanced intelligent multi-beam LED technology which features here. At the rear, the boxy shape is rounded off by this subtle tailgate spoiler and your attention is also distracted from the squarical lines by this silvered lower panel that stretches across the lower part of the bumper and surrounds the tailpipes. Uh, the two-piece LED tail lights have a distinctive nighttime illuminated signature and their reflectors have been relocated to the bumpers, plus spoiler lips in the tail lamps and on the rear bumper lower aerodynamic lift and improve handling stability too. Of course, as usual, what's rather more important is the stuff that you can't see. Uh, in this case, it's the sophisticated MFA2 compact car platform we mentioned earlier, underpinnings that this GLB shares with all of Mercedes' current uh, front-driven compact models. It's primarily because of this chassis that this car manages to be, well, nearly half a tonne lighter than an equivalent version of its closest rival, the Land over Discovery Sport. Yet the GLB structure is particularly stiff and strong, high strength, ultra high strength and hot formed steel panels accounting for about 72% of this body shell. Okay, time to check out the part of the car that Mercedes promises will really sell it to you, the interior. In its own way, the cabin is as distinctive as the boxy silhouette with interior architecture that's shaped by the avant-garde design of the dashboard. Uh, you will have seen this sort of thing before if you're familiar with any of Mercedes' other most recent compact models, a so-called widescreen cockpit concept that does away with a kind of cowled instrument binnacle that almost every other car on the market has to have. Uh, as a result, the wing-shaped main body of the fascia extends from one side of the cabin to the other uh, with no visual discontinuity. Now all of that is just as it would be in an A-class, a B-class, a CLA or a GLA, but here, as GLB customers would want, it's all fashioned into a cabin with a slightly more SUV-like feel and a slightly higher seating height. Little touches help here, uh, the aluminium look tubular element on the dashboard on the passenger side and the horizontal grab handle that's been fitted to each door. This is supposed to resemble a milled aluminium tube.
As ever in a Mercedes, you're surrounded by premium touches. A glossy piano black coated center console that flows up into the dash, a Nappa leather trimmed sports steering wheel, uh, comfort spec seats stitched with Artico man-made leather, a jewel-like overhead lighting panel, and intricately fashioned door cards with double-stitched hide panels. Three circular vents decorate the mid-level part of the center stack with two further ones either side at the end of the dash. And these outlets are an integral part of the classy ambient lighting system, which brings the interior alive at night, especially when, as here, it's been upgraded to 64 color status. Luxury downsizers will love it all. The real talking point here, though, remains the widescreen cockpit package. It's made up of two elongated square color TFT screens, one for the center dash touchscreen media display, the other for the digital instrument display dials you view through this sophisticated three-spoke multifunction steering wheel. Now, both of those screens are seven inches in size with the two most affordable levels of trim, that Sport or AMG line, but ideally, of course, you'll want to upgrade to an AMG line premium variant like this one, which enlarges both of them to 10.25 inches. Now, with the two larger screens in place, as here, you get the full intended widescreen effect, and there are plenty of ways to interact with this whole MBUX or Mercedes-Benz user experience setup. There's touchscreen, voice control, and various touch pads. Now, don't worry, we'll talk you through all that. Let's start with this centre stack display. That's your portal for interacting with all of the infotainment system's expected features. So phone, navigation, uh, radio, media, comfort, information, and so on. Uh, there are sections for Wi-Fi connectivity and apps, and that allows you to access everything from a web browser to info on weather, restaurants and hotels. Plus, you can scroll through a wide selection of informational screens featuring wondrous graphics, uh, some of which you'll find embellished if you scroll down further and access some of the so-called uh, various themes, which are adventure, trip, experience, efficiency and lounge. And they combine preset layout and color styles so you can quickly change the cabin ambiance to suit your mood. Now, this MBUX package is supposed to take in-car connectivity to a new level, a boast that in our view is slightly undermined by the setup's failure to include standard Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring across the range. And that's something that your GLB won't include unless it happens to feature a smartphone integration package. And you can only have that on the more expensive versions of this car. Uh, what you do get across the range, though, is a superb standard 3D navigation system, which on the plushest variant is uh, embellished with what Mercedes calls augmented reality technology. Now, this is effectively a live camera feed of the road ahead that's overlaid with house numbers, uh, road names, direction arrows, and other useful bits of information that'll help you to find your way. Now, it only responds to the first voice it hears on any given journey. So uh, children crowing, hey, Mercedes, from the back seat won't be able to annoy you by constantly altering your chosen screen functions. Uh, now, as we have remarked when we were testing some of the company's other more recent models, uh, the voice control aspect of MBUX remains, in our view, uh, something of a work in progress. But in our estimation, it's a setup that's currently rivaled only by BMW for intuitive responsiveness. Conventional voice control technology that usually requires certain specific voice commands from users, but uh, this system here's Linguatronic natural speech recognition is really pretty good at understanding almost anything you ask of it. It's particularly good at things like finding new radio stations or telling you what the weather is at a program destination. If you can't be bothered with voice control and you don't want to stab away at the touch screen, then you'll need to get very familiar with the various manual touch pads that offer a further way to activate these infotainment elements. The main one being down here at the base of the center stack. Now this offers a kind of useful functionality that you'd uh, absolutely have to do without in a rival Land Rover Discovery Sport. Now usually we don't especially like touchpad controllers. I mean, on the move, they're difficult to access 
accurately used on anything but smooth surfaces. But this particular one is the best of its kind. Uh, it has easy functionality that's helped by these surrounding shortcut buttons for key vehicle features. Uh, a note to Lexus here, if you want to give customers touchpad controllers, this is how you do it. Two more touchpads also feature, both much smaller and both here on the steering wheel. The first on the left hand spoke, offering yet another way of fiddling with features on the centre screen there. Uh, the little touchpad on the right hand steering wheel spoke is for customising what you see in the digital instrument display in the binnacle ahead. Uh, it's a screen that's divided into three configurable sectors. Flick on that right hand touchpad and you'll bring up a horizontal menu for tailoring this instrument binnacle monitor's central section with selectable telephone, radio and media functions, plus drive assistance, uh, telephone and navigation features that you'll also have the option to expand across the the entire display as you might want to do for example if you uh, like the idea of having full screen mapping right in your line of sight here. Uh, the two virtual dials on the left and right of the binnacle screen are also both customizable and that depends on what you need to see. If you don't want the left hand one in its usual guise as a speedometer it can instead show things like trip computer info or gradient graphics and a compass. The right hand dial meanwhile would normally be a rev counter but that can also show uh, consumption readings, a proactive eco display, GPS mapping, a g-forces readout, safety assistance info or on the formatic variants a four-wheel drive graphic. You can tailor the color and style layout of both the center stack touchscreen media display and this digital instrument display via four available styles and display options, uh, blue themed classic, uh, yellow themed sport, orange themed progressive and a minimalistic black themed uh, understated. Got all that? Good. Enough on connectivity, uh, what else do you need to know about this cabin? Well, despite the Gelandewagen pretensions, you don't sit anything like as high as you would do in a rival Land Rover Discovery Sport. That might be an issue for committed SUV folk. And there are areas where this GLB's premium pretensions do slip up a little. Uh, the air vents, for example, don't feel to the touch as great as they look to the eye. Uh, although build quality from the Mexican plant in Aguascalientes uh, seems strong, signs of cost saving can be found when you run your fingers around the edging around the door bins or along the uh, footwell panels of the lower centre console. Um, the panels for climate control and overhead lighting flex when you prod them and if you happen to have forked out well over well £40,000 for an upper spec version of this car, the rather flimsy column mounted transmission stalk uh, that it shares with a Mercedes Sprinter van might not be quite the kind of thing you'd have been expecting. Time to take a seat in the second row. Now you might not have particularly high expectations here from what is, as we said earlier, a platform that was essentially designed for much smaller cars. Still, as we also mentioned earlier, the wheelbase has been usefully extended right out to 2,829 millimeters. And a lot of thoughts gone into this design and the way that families will use it. Uh, take for example, the way that these doors here uh, overlap the sills. Now this keeps the door openings and therefore the trouser legs of boarding passengers from getting dirty. Space-wise, it's actually not too bad back here. It's helped enormously by the fact that this bench base can be slid uh, backwards and forwards over a range of 140 millimetres, 90 mils to the front and 50 mils to the rear. It's not quite as flexible as the arrangement that's fitted to a rival Land Rover Discovery Sport that has three second row seats, which all slide independently of each other. Here, the base has a simpler 60-40 split. Uh, still, it all works effectively up to 967 mils of leg space Space, allows even six footers to get comfortable and the backrests recline too through eight stages plus the seats uh, back here are mounted a bit higher than those at the front which gives a better view forward and out of the side windows and that might help with travel sickness for younger folk. Uh, the slight downside of uh, that approach is that headroom is slightly affected, taller folk will fit a little more easily into a Discovery Sport and they'll get a bit more shoulder room in that car too. 
Still, three adults wouldn't be too squashed back here. And there are some nice little design touches, like these intricately fashioned circular twin central vents and these silver tubular-style door handles. And the sheer quality back here makes up for a lot, uh, particularly on a plusher variant like this one with its Dynamica trimmed red-stitched door cards. Practicalities include seat back nets, uh, reasonably sized door pockets with bottle holders and coat hooks in the overhead grab handles. On the transmission tunnel, uh, there is an open storage area and a pull-out cubby with twin USB-C ports. And if you can avoid entry level trim, you'll get the central armrest here with its pop-out cup holders. What about the third row seating? Well, you don't have to have it, provided you're happy to have your GLB in 220D formatic form. Mercedes will also offer you a five seat only version, but we can't really see why you wouldn't want those extra rearmost chairs. Uh, getting to them requires a certain degree of athleticism, however, which will probably be beyond granny on her Sunday trip to the garden center. Uh, that's because you have to step up and once you uh, pull the second row backrest out of the way by this, easy entry catch, uh, the aperture that opens up for third row access is as narrow as it usually is with SUVs in this segment. Third row legroom is as restricted as the class norm too. Now you see why virtually all SUVs in this class have sliding middle row seats. Unless this middle row could be pushed forward a bit, these third row chairs here would be basically unusable by all except very small children and eunuchs. Even with a bit of give and take from those ahead, an average sized adult isn't going to want to be back here for too long. Uh, these seats aren't as thick and supportive as those ahead because they have to fit beneath the floor and you will need to erect the headrests every time you sit back here because otherwise these will dig uncomfortably into your back. Now, as usual with a seven-seat SUV, you sit uh, with your knees up towards your stomach and uh, headroom is at, well, something of a premium, let's say. In fact, Mercedes says it really isn't safe for someone over 1.68 metres in height to be sat back here at all. Still, all of this is pretty par for the course with the crossover of this kind. Uh, conditions in this part of the car would be fractionally better in a volume branded class competitor like the Skoda Kodiak or the Kia Sorento. But this GLB's premium brand rival, that Discovery Sport, doesn't provide as much space as you get here to push your feet under the seats in front. Mercedes hasn't forgotten, as some rival makers in this sector have, to fit Isofix child seat fastening points back here, and the window airbags extend back to cover these seats too. Talking of windows, these rearmost ones are decently sized and you get an overhead light. Twin cup holders are provided between the seats here, and on either side there's an elasticated side strap and there's a recessed compartment with a USB-C port. Finally, we'll take a look at the boot, and that's accessed via a standard Easy Pack powered tailgate. But on this plusher variant, can be activated by a wave of your foot beneath the bumper uh, if you happen to be uh, approaching your GLB all laden down with child seats and uh, other paraphernalia like shopping bags. You access the cargo area across this in practically silver trimmed bumper lip and that'll probably get uh, quickly scratched unless you're very careful indeed. Obviously there won't be very much space to play with if all three rows are in use, just 130 litres. So in this kind of configuration you'll be limited to carrying a few shopping bags and not a lot else. At least so the tonneau cover can be stored beneath the floor here. Now you can't do that on the Land Rover model that we keep mentioning and that has just 115 litres of space in this configuration. Most of the time though you're going to be travelling with these rearmost chairs folded into the floor, uh, a simple action activated by pulling on these red straps. That'll improve cargo capacity to at least 500 litres with the second row backrest pushed right back towards you. There is as much as 640 litres available if you're able to push it right forward, however. In either scenario, you can grab a bit more capacity by altering the angle of the second row backrests into a more upright cargo position. Now, that could be just enough to get suitcases in on an airport run, for example. A Discovery Sport, if you're interested, would give you 140 litres more room. 
The five-seat only GLB model, incidentally, has a boot capacity figure that varies between 570 and 760 litres thanks to its lower floor. If you're able to flatten the second row in this seven-seat model, you can free up as much as 1,055 litres or as much as 1,680 litres if you load to the roof. In other markets, you can further extend that space with an optional fold-flat front passenger seat. Here, though, you're going to have to take really long items like surfboards on the roof. From launch GLB pricing for mainstream models sat in the 35 to 46,000 pound bracket across four main trim levels, base sport, AMG line, AMG line premium, that's what we've got here, and AMG line premium plus with driving assistance. Now you'll need uh, more if you want the top performance Mercedes AMG GLB 35 formatic variant of course from introduction that was priced from just over 49,000 pounds. With base sport trim, you have to have the GLB 200 petrol model with its 1.3 litre, 160 V horsepower unit. But with the various AMG line levels, you get the chance to find around 800 pounds more for the alternative 150 horsepower, 2 litre GLB 200 diesel variant. With this plush AMG line premium trim, your options widen further. You can pay nearly 2,000 pounds more to have the GLB 200D fitted out with 4Matic four wheel drive. Or if your budget stretches beyond the £43,000 mark, you can get the gutsier GLB 220D diesel variant we're trying here, which has the same 2-litre engine tuned out to 190 horsepower and comes with 4Matic as standard. If you prioritise efficiency but you don't want a diesel, then you can talk to your dealer about the GLB 250E plug-in hybrid petrol variant, which mates a 1.33-litre petrol engine with an electric motor powered by a 13.6 kilowatt hour battery offering an electrified driving range of over 30 miles. Uh, there is also a full electric EQB model too. What else do you need to know? Uh, well, possibly that you have to have automatic transmission on a GLB. You'd probably want that anyway. Uh, all the auto boxes are, as usual, of the smooth twin clutch variety, a seven speeder on the GLB 200 petrol. There's an eight speeder to cope with the extra torque of the pair of two litre diesels. And there's a bespoke AMG Speedshift DCT 8G eight speeder featuring on the wild Mercedes AMG 35 formatic performance variant. The other thing you need to know is here, unlike in other markets, that a seven seat cabin format is a core standard feature across the range. If you really don't want that though, then your dealer will brief you on the fact that there is a five seat version of this GLB 220D AMG line premium model, which will save you around 700 pounds over the usual seven seat variant. Before we get into competitor comparisons, let's position this car for you in Mercedes' own range. Uh, the compact GLA model with a similar engine and spec is around £1,500 less. The only engineering package that this GLB shares with the brand's supposedly larger GLC is that of this 220D formatic variant, which with equivalent AMG line premium trim and that engine would cost around £4,000 more in GLC form. You might also consider a Mercedes C-Class Estate as a possible alternative. Uh, now, in the closest comparable form, that would cost around £3,000 more. We can't really imagine, though, that there'll actually be too much uh, cross-shopping with other Mercedes models here. Uh, this GLB's appeal is pretty specific. Now, not least because now that the seven-seat option in the E-Class Estate is no longer offered. So if you want three rows of chairs in any other Mercedes, then you'll probably need around £60,000. And that's the sum that'll get you either the V-Class MPV or conceivably a GLE SUV with the seven-seat option added in. The wider market can't help you too much with direct GLB alternatives either. 
A number of upper mid-sized seven-seat SUVs are now popular in this car segment, but the only one with a proper premium badge is Land Rover's Discovery Sport. Now, prices for that car start a bit higher than is the case for this Mercedes because the Disco can't be had without all-wheel drive. Uh, where direct comparisons can be made between those two products with comparable levels of spec and output, uh, you'll generally find that the Land Rover product costs around £1,500 to £2,000 more uh, than an equivalent formatic GLB variant. The Discovery Sport though is a slightly sharper steer and it's a bit better off the road. The GLB is higher tech inside, it's got a classier cabin and it's more efficient so it depends on your priorities. Of course, if you're not particularly bothered about badge equity in this class, then your options will widen to include several volume brand models. A likely starting point for a likely customer here might be with Volkswagen's Tiguan Allspace. Uh, that actually will cost nearly the same as a GLB with equivalent engines and spec. Uh, you would expect two other volume brand contenders, though, the Skoda Kodiak and the Seat Taraco, to cost quite a lot less. And sure enough, those two would save you four to five thousand pounds over a GLB with equivalent engines and spec. Uh, what else? Well, we can't really see GLB folk considering models like the Nissan X-Trail or the Ssangyong Rexton. And a Peugeot 5008, that wouldn't cost you very much less than a GLB, and it can't be had with all-wheel drive. Better matches might be found with the Kia Sorento and the Hyundai Santa Fe, but they've been moved up market and these days they really only directly compete uh, with the top mainstream version of this Mercedes, uh, this GLB 220D uh, AMG Lime Premium model, and they cost around about the same. If you are looking at this particular GLB derivative, then you might want to know that a comparable boxy Land Rover Defender 110 would probably cost you around £10,000 or so more with an equivalent level of spec. But enough with alternatives. As we've just said, there's nothing quite like a GLB. If you find yourself agreeing and attracted by this car, you're going to need to know just how generous Mercedes has been with the standard spec. So let's take a look at that now. Now, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the starting point in the range lies with a single sports specification GLB 200 petrol model, but that still comes with a reasonable amount. Uh, there's 18-inch alloy wheels, LED high-performance headlamps, uh, there's polished aluminium roof rails and there's an easy pack powered tailgate too. You get a 180 degree reversing camera but uh, rear parking sensors at this level are missing and that is a significant omission. Inside uh, sport trim has just enough to make you feel special. The upholstery is trimmed in black Artico man-made leather matched to Albury fabric plus you get comfort spec seats that are heated down at the front. Uh, there's also Thermotronic automatic climate control and there's a multifunction Nappa leather trimmed and stitched sports steering wheel with gear shift paddles along with velour floor mats, an alarm and a cruise control with a speed limiter. As usual with the Mercedes, there's also the Dynamic Select driving mode system that allows you to adjust throttle response, steering feel and gear shift timings to suit the way that you want to drive. The real GLB cabin talking point, though, is the clever MBUX, Mercedes-Benz User Experience Multimedia Infotainment System. That's controlled by two high-resolution screens. With the base Sport and AMG line trim levels, you get a 7-inch one for the instrument cluster and a further 7-inch one for the uh, centre of the dash. The MBUX system is built around the brand's Hey Mercedes voice activation system, and you'll quickly find yourself using that to operate many of the interior features. Now these include a 100 watt DAB audio setup, Bluetooth and a live traffic information feature that's free for the first three years of ownership. There's hard disk navigation too of course plus three years use of the Mercedes navigation services setup which allows the car to answer questions about your journey. So things like fuel prices along the route, available parking spaces at your destination or the current weather. What you don't get, at least at this level in the range, is the smartphone integration package, which gives you Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring, uh, which in this day and age isn't really acceptable on a car of this price.
talking of information technology, are like most premium brands, Mercedes has developed systems which allow you to monitor many aspects of your vehicle from your smartphone. Now, every GLB model comes as standard with the Mercedes Me Connect vehicle monitoring package, and that works via a free app. Now, this reminds you when a service is due, and it can automatically detect and share with you details on your car's wear and tear items. In addition, the app will give you a one-touch button for fast accident and breakdown recovery, and it automatically alerts the rescue services in the event of an accident. It can even track your GLB if it's stolen and tell you if it's left a pre-agreed geographical boundary if you lend the car out. It can preset the cabin climate before you reach the car, and it'll tell you where the vehicle is if you've gone and forgotten where you parked it. All of that is included across the GLB range. Most buyers, though, are probably going to want to find the extra to move up at least as far as mid-range AMG line spec. At this level, your car will come with AMG body styling for the front apron, the rear bumper and apron, plus the door panels, plus this diamond-style single louver radiator grille is embellished by chrome pins. You also get these five twin-spoke 19-inch tantalite grey alloy wheels with Mercedes-branded calipers, along with privacy glass, brushed stainless steel pedals, uh, part Dynamica red-stitched microfiber trim for the Artico leather upholstery, carbon structure cabin inlays, galvanised gear shift paddles, AMG floor mats and a rear armrest. If you want more, the AMG line premium model we've been trying here also includes power folding mirrors and an active parking assist with Parktronic system, which includes those missing rear parking sensors along with front sensors too, and will automatically steer you into spaces. At this level in the range, you also get a keyless go comfort package, which includes keyless entry and which allows you to open the easy pack powered tailgate with a wave of your foot beneath the bumper. Uh, there is also a wireless charging mat, illuminated door sill panels, a 64 color ambient lighting system and pre-installation for a trailer coupling. The main reason you'd want to upgrade to this AMG line premium trim level though is to get its higher standard of infotainment and media connectivity. Now at this level in the range, uh, the digital instrument panel and the center stack touchscreen media display, they're both enlarged to 10.25 inches in size and that's as part of a setup that includes quite a lot more. The missing smartphone integration package which gives you Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring, that at this level is present and correct, as is an uprated 255 watt 10 speaker advanced sound system. Plus the 3D sat nav uh, gains a feature we really like, something that Mercedes calls augmented reality navigation. This is effectively a live camera feed of the road ahead, overlaid with house numbers, road names, direction arrows and other bits of useful information which will help you to find your way. The pack also includes traffic sign assist, which pictures speed signs as you pass them and then displays them on the dash. At the top of the range is AMG Line Premium Plus with driving assistance trim, which really is all about adding in extra technology. Uh, the more sophisticated multi-beam LED headlamps, for example, which have 18 individually controllable high-performance LEDs per multi-beam LED module to implement a split main beam with 16 controllable individual segments. This uh, tech allows these headlamps to constantly adapt themselves to road conditions and to other motorists. Cornering lights are activated when you're turning. Uh, there's a special roundabout lighting function and a special city light for built-up areas with street lamps. Other premium plus inclusions run to the panoramic glass roof that we'd really want given this car's rather dark interior. And there's powered front seats with memory settings and lumbar support. Plus, as the trim designation suggests, here at the top of the mainstream lineup, you get a whole portfolio of extra safety and driving assistance systems, which we'll cover off you in a moment when we move on to talking about safety. That same premium plus level of trim also features a standard on the top Mercedes AMG GLB 35 formatic performance variant, along of course with a number of bespoke AMG features to make it really stand out. There's AMG styling for the front and rear aprons and the rear spoiler, plus an AMG specific radiator grille and an AMG night package which colors exterior elements in black. Uh, through the spokes of the unique 
five twin spoke design matte black 20 inch alloy wheels. You glimpse the silver brake calipers of the AMG high performance braking system. Plus you get adaptive damping and a Burmester surround sound system too. What about options across the GLB range? Well, there are a few things we'd like to have seen listed here, like adaptive damping, a head-up display, a 230-volt rear socket, a fold-flat front passenger seat, and the clever Mercedes Energizing package, which combines music, lighting, and selective seat massaging into various selectable programs. All of those features are available on the GLB in other markets, but at the time of this test in autumn 2020, they weren't available here. Most of what you can have is practically orientated, a tow bar of course, onto which can be attached a rear mounted bicycle rack and you can add the roof carrier bars that you'll need for a roof box and a roof cycle carrier. For the boot there's a reversible mat, a shallow boot tub and a concertina load seal protector. You can also specify a cool box, a picnic hamper and mounts to attach uh, tablet PCs to the backs of the front head restraints. Mercedes also has a range of bespoke design child seats. Bear in mind that unless you specify your GLB in the only standard colour available, that solid polar white, you'll have to be paying your dealer extra for one of the six metallic paint shades available. We've got Cosmos Black here. If you want something more distinctive, there are also two much pricier Designio shades, Patagonia Red and the ridiculously expensive Mountain Grey Magno. Perhaps the key option for GLB customers to consider though is the optional off-road engineering package that's available to diesel formatic variants specified with some kind of AMG line trim. This gives you an additional off-road dynamic select driving mode which adjusts the power delivery and the ABS control in a way that will help in light forest tracks. Uh, there's also a downhill speed regulation feature, uh, basically hill descent control to ease you down slippery slopes and you get a clever off-road light built into the multi-beam LED headlights that in off-road mode remains permanently switched on at speeds of up to 31 miles an hour, allowing you to more easily see obstacles in rough terrain in the dark. On to safety. Uh, this car's MFA2 platform was one of the first to be engineered by Mercedes at the brand's Technology Centre for Vehicle Safety in Sindelfingen, which develops vehicle structures based on findings from research into real accidents. Every single body shell component of this model was developed according to the loads and stresses encountered in real world crashes with respect to material thickness, sheet steel quality and joining technology. And of course, this GLB includes all the usual camera driven kit too. As standard you get active brake assist, autonomous braking, that's one of those setups that scans the road ahead as you drive, warning you of potential accident hazards and it's also capable of autonomously braking the car if you don't respond to the warnings or perhaps you aren't able to. Testing has indicated that that whole setup would eradicate 20% of nose to tail accidents and will decrease their severity in a further 25% of cases. Active lane keeping assist is also standard across the GLB range. That's able not only to warn you if you drift across lane markings, but it's also capable of applying subtle steering lock to ease the car back to where it ought to be. In addition, Mercedes includes another important camera safety feature, a tension assist. Now this monitors your reactions to detect drowsiness. Plus the Mercedes Me Connect app we mentioned earlier includes an e-call emergency call system which will automatically alert the emergency services to your exact location should the airbags be deployed in an accident. More familiar standard safety stuff includes ABS brakes which automatically prime themselves in wet weather and flash the rear lights in emergency stops to warn following motorists. Plus there's an ESP stability control system with acceleration skid control and curved dynamic assist for extra cornering traction. If all that's not enough to keep you out of the hedge, then there are also twin front side and curtain airbags. Uh, the curtain bags extend right back to cover the third row. Plus there's a driver's knee bag, anti-whiplash head restraints, ice fix child seat fastenings for both second and third rows, uh, a deformable steering column, crash responsive emergency lighting and a pedestrian friendly bonnet. Plus you get a tyre pressure monitoring system uh, and also there's hill start assist to stop you from rolling backwards on uphill junctions. 
If you want to go further and get some of the choicest elements of Mercedes camera driven safety tech, uh, then you'll need, as I suggested earlier, to buy in right at the very top of the range and choose either the AMG line premium plus with driving assistance trim or the top Mercedes AMG GLB 35 formatic model. These variants both come complete with the brand's driving assistance package, which includes nine key extra elements, amongst which are features that also give this car uh, some limited autonomous driving capability. Let's talk you through all that. Uh, let's start with active blind spot assist, which can warn you of vehicles in your blind spot during a lane change and can help to avoid a collision by means of one-sided braking intervention. Uh, there is braking stuff too, of course. Uh, there's the active braking assist with cross traffic function feature that can help to avoid accidents with vehicles ahead, uh, with crossing traffic and also with pedestrians and or mitigate their consequences. The pack also includes Mercedes Clever Pre-Safe Plus Anticipatory System, which can sense a rear-end collision fractions of a second before it happens. And so before impact, we'll be able to automatically pre-tension the seat belts, close the windows, and if fitted, position the power sunroof and the electric seats to provide for optimum crash survival. There is also an evasive steering assist uh, system that can support you in making evasive maneuvers if a pedestrian or a cyclist suddenly appears in your path plus a clever route-based speed adjustment feature works with GPS data to automatically adapt your speed before curves, roundabouts and junctions. Traffic sign assist displays speed signs as you pass them on the car's digital displays and an exit warning function alerts occupants to oncoming traffic when they're about to leave the vehicle. As we mentioned, the driving assistance package also includes limited autonomous driving capability to suit the mood of the moment. Uh, that comes courtesy of the pack's active distance assist Distronic system, and it's designed to operate on dual carriageway, and it works with the Mercedes active steering assist setup. Now, the Distronic feature is basically a super advanced adaptive cruise control, which uh, automatically regulates your distance to the car in front and can, if necessary, remotely slow the car with up to 50% of stopping power. Active steering assist keeps you in the center of your designated lane and will, if needed, apply subtle steering correction to ease you back to where you should be. It's all very reassuring. Over engineering. Is there really a place for that in the modern automotive world? Well, take the genre under inspection here, that for premium badged upper mid sized seven seat SUVs. Land Rover wants to give you one of those. It's Discovery Sport in a package that will allow you to traverse the odd swamp. But the downside of that is the need for a chassis substantial enough to deliver a curb weight of around two tons. Mercedes thinks that's unnecessary, so while the G-Wagen style looks of this GLB promise the potential to attempt an alpine mountain sheep track, its actual engineering is targeted at the high street rather than the highlands. That means, as we've been saying elsewhere in this film, an A-Class derived MFA2 platform that allows this car to tip the scales nearly half a tonne lighter than its disco rival. You would expect that to have quite an impact on WLTP rated efficiency readings, and of course it does. Uh, for all its trumpeted mild hybrid MHEV engine efficiency, the Disco Sport is way off the readings you'll get from a GLB, and as are most other segment rivals. Take the GLB 220D Formatic 190 horsepower variant we're trying here, which manages up to 47.9 mpg on the combined cycle and 156 grams per kilometer of CO2. For for comparison, a Disco Sport D200 MHEV model manages best readings of 41.4 mpg and 179 grams per kilometre. In other words, if you were going to choose the Land Rover, you'd have to think in terms of a running cost penalty of around 20% for ultimate adventure prowess that you'll almost certainly never use. There's a similar gap in the stats between the GLB and most of its direct competitors if you switch your attention to the lesser powered mainstream models. Uh, with the detuned 150 horsepower version of the 2 litre diesel we're trying here, the GLB 200D manages 49.6 mpg and 149 grams per kilometre in front driven form, or 47.9 and 155 grams per kilometre in formatic guise. 
As for the entry-level front-driven GLB 200 1.3 litre petrol variant, uh, well, aided by cylinder deactivation, which disables two of the four cylinders under light to medium throttle loads, that model manages up to 40.4 mpg and 160 grams per kilometre. Those are the sorts of figures which uh, might be able to justify the switch to this sort of car from a conventional family hatch. Not so the readings from the most frugal petrol-powered Discovery Sport, though. Uh, the base P200 version of that car, which admittedly has to be ordered in four-wheel drive form, can only manage up to 30.1 mpg and 211 grams per kilometre. Even the top road-racing Mercedes-AMG GLB 35 formatic 306 horsepower petrol model does better than that, uh, 32.5 mpg and 197 grams per kilometre. If you want even more running cost efficiency than a diesel GLB can give you, or you merely disapprove of black pump fuel, uh, then you'll want to ask your dealer about the alternative GLB 250E plug-in hybrid petrol model. As mentioned in our driving experience section, this mates a 1.33 litre petrol engine with a gearbox mounted 75 kilowatt electric motor that's powered by a 15.6 kilowatt hour battery, able to provide an electric range of just over 30 miles. Uh, the battery can be charged via 7.4 kilowatt wall box with AC current in one hour 45 minutes from 10 to 100 percent. Using DC charging at 24 kilowatts, charging from 10 to 80 percent takes only 25 minutes. Keep everything charged up, and Mercedes reckons that 90 percent of regular commuting journeys in a GLB 250e could be completed without using the petrol engine at all. As a result, the quoted WLTP combined cycle fuel reading is up towards 250 miles per gallon and your CO2 emissions will be in, in the region of around 30 grams per kilometre, which will mean a super low BIK tax rating in single figures. By comparison, the GLB 200 petrol and diesel variants have a BIK rating of 31%. For this GLB 220D, it's 32%. You can see the attraction, uh, but of course you might be ready to wean yourself off combustion fuel entirely, in which case you need to talk to your dealer about the all-electric EQB full EV version of this design. As you'd expect, all the engines provided here meet the latest RDE2 Euro 60 temp emission standards, and all the figures we just quoted are aided by this car's optimized aerodynamics. Thanks to extensive paneling of the engine bay and of the underbody, uh, this model's 0.30 CD drag factor is actually pretty good for a boxy SUV. Plus, of course, there are all the usual elements of energy-saving engineering, Things like low rolling resistance tyres, uh, brake energy regeneration, electric power steering, and adjustable radiator shutter, and intelligent management of engine ancillaries like the alternator, the oil feed, and the water pump. As usual, you get an eco start stop function that cuts the engine when you don't need it, when you're waiting at the lights or stuck in traffic. And in addition, the auto gearbox features a sailing function that uh, disconnects engine drive uh, to cruise for greater efficiency. Even the full LED headlights help. They use about 70% less energy than traditional halogen lamps. To get anywhere near the quoted official figures on a regular basis, you'll need to make sure that you're regularly using your GLB in its dynamic select system's uh, most frugal eco setting. Uh, this marginally limits the accelerator pedal curve, and it also slightly restricts the output of the climate control system, the heated rear window, and if it's fitted, the seat heating. Plus, it automatically activates the sailing feature for the automatic gearbox that we were just talking about. A fuel consumption section on the central MBUX display screen gives you graphical evidence of your success or otherwise in achieving maximum frugality over different time periods, uh, 7.5, 30, 90 or 180 minutes. And a vehicle screen that shows the percentage of gas, that means throttle or brake pressure that you're using at any given time. And we particularly like the eco display that can show on the instrument binnacle. It grades you on acceleration, constant motion and the amount of fuel free coasting that you've done. This graphic is also incorporated into a larger efficiency briefing layout, which also shows driving range and regenerative braking charge. An eco display is also provided on the Mercedes Me Connect app. 
What else? Uh, well, residuals are satisfyingly strong by class standards. Independent experts reckon that a GRB 220D formatic like this one will be worth £18,700 after three years and 60,000 miles of use. Now, we would normally place a caution here that uh, going mad on the options list would place a bit of a dent in expected depreciation, although in this case, there is a caveat that used buyers may be actively seeking models upgraded at least to AMG line premium status, which gets you the instrument display and the central media screen in their larger 10.25 inch sizes. And insurance? Well, you can insure your car through Mercedes, although most company drivers will have that element included in their lease cost. Uh, if you do pay the insurance on your car yourself, then you might want to know that the base GLB 200 petrol variant, that's rated at between Group 27 and 29. Uh, that depends on spec, of course. With the GLB 200D diesel, it's Group 29 or 30, depending on spec. Uh, this GLB 220D is 35 or 36. At uh, the top, Mercedes AMG GLB 35 formatic is rated at Group 41E. Most GLB models will cost £140 a year to tax, but all the formatic and the AMG line premium plus variants will crest the £40,000 price barrier, which will result in a £310 annual VED surcharge. As you'd expect, the Mercedes aftercare package is comprehensive with a three-year unlimited mileage warranty that matches BMW but beats Land Rover. Uh, this is built on by the Mercedes Mobilo scheme, which delivers breakdown cover for up to 30 years as long as you continue to have your car serviced at a Mercedes main dealer. Ah, now maintenance, uh, as usual with one of the Stuttgart brand's models, there's an Assist Plus dashboard service indicator, uh, which monitors engine use and tells you exactly when a garage visit's due. Uh, for reference, servicing is usually required every 15,500 miles or every year, whichever comes around first. Fixed price servicing is available across the range and most buyers opt for the Mercedes Service Care Plan which could cost you as little as about £30 a month based either on a two service, two year deal, uh, three years with three services or four years with four services. Whichever package you opt for, it'll cover the cost of all the recommended service items such as brake fluid, spark plugs, uh, air filters, fuel filters and screen wash. It's also worth mentioning that the standard Mercedes me connect services package includes remote self-diagnostic capability and that enables your GLB to monitor wear and tear items and to alert your local dealer uh, to let you know if something needs seeing to. At first glance, you might think the GLB an unnecessary further addition to the Mercedes SUV lineup. After looking closely at what it has to offer, we've ended up concluding though that going forward, it's likely to be a vital part of it. The brand has never before offered a car in this class that's really practical for a growing family, yet remains reasonably affordable. This is it. Are there issues? Well, probably. Uh, you could pay slightly less and get a slightly bigger seven-seat SUV in this segment from a volume brand, but after trying a GLB, we think you may not want to. It has a premium, desirable feel that cars like Skoda's Kodiak, Hyundai Santa Fe, say it's Taraco, and even Volkswagen's Tiguan Allspace struggle to match. And the interior technology of those cars seems rather yesteryear compared to the cabin MediaTek on offer here. This car's only really direct premium badge rival, the Land Rover Discovery Sport, can't equal this GLB's interior either. Uh, yes, that Sony Hull product does steer more sharply than this Mercedes, and it can go a little further off road, but neither attribute is likely to be particularly important to a typical GLB customer. And in segment, there's absolutely nothing like the wild Mercedes AMG GLB 35 performance variant. And in summary, well, you probably won't have started off wanting a GLB in this class, but take a closer look and its hold on you might grow. Hip to be square. There's something in that. <laughs> <laughs>